This is the story of Queen Elizabeth II and the country she has reigned over for 60 glorious years. She has worked with 12 British Prime Ministers and their governments, united 54 sovereign states into our Commonwealth family. Through turbulent times and unprecedented change, tragedy and celebration, our monarch has been ever present, our symbol of stability and strength. These are the Queen's diamond decades. The arrival of the 1960s found Britain in optimistic mood. People finally had money to spend. They're cheap at ten pounds. I want one customer, the complete set. Five pounds, the complete lot. Get them there, one. Post-war austerity had given way to something of a consumer boom. And springtime brought with it that time on an excuse for a party, a royal wedding. On the eve of the big event, London was buzzing. Although it would be the first royal wedding to be televised live, vast crowds still wanted to see everything with their own eyes. As dawn broke, thousands were getting prepared for the big day. Princess Margaret, the Queen's youngest sister, was marrying Anthony Armstrong Jones, a talented society photographer who was an unconventional choice by traditional royal standards. Finally, the public felt their princess had found true love. People stood ten deep along that familiar route from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Abbey, hoping to catch a glimpse of the bride. In the absence of her beloved father, the late King George VI, Princess Margaret's brother-in-law, the Duke of Edinburgh, would give her away. The sumptuous ceremony of Westminster Abbey on a royal occasion. Eight bridesmaids are here, led by Princess Anne, the niece of the bride. Here at the steps of the altar, the bridegroom awaits her. A young man, calm and dignified in the midst of this happy ordeal. Margaret Rose, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou obey him and serve him, love, honor, and keep him in sickness and in health so long as ye both shall live? After signing the register, the princess's first act was to curtsy to her sister, the queen. They emerge now as man and wife. Mr. Armstrong Jones and Her Royal Highness, the Princess Margaret, Mrs. Armstrong Jones. The spectacle of a royal fairy tale was as popular as ever, and jubilant crowds cheered the couple back to Buckingham Palace. Princess Margaret looks stunning in a simple, tight-waisted gown of white silk organza, which had been created by Norman Hartnell, the royal dressmaker. The Queen and all the royal family were delighted to see the free-spirited princess happy at last, at the age of 29. But before the 120 guests could settle down to a wedding breakfast, the bride and groom had one final engagement to fulfil. And, as ever, there was a huge rush to see the royal couple on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. <laughs> 1960 had already seen another new addition to the royal family. And at last came the announcement, awaited by the whole Commonwealth and indeed almost the whole world. The Queen's third child, His Royal Highness Prince Andrew Albert Christian Edward, was welcomed in style. He was the first baby to be born to a reigning sovereign since 1857. 
and would be second in line to the British throne, instantly overtaking Princess Anne. The infant prince was finally introduced to the cameras seven months later. Born a decade after his brother Charles and sister Anne, the Queen and Prince Philip had waited to extend their family, and there was no concealing their pride and delight. The only members of the party not perhaps completely happy are the corgi dogs, feeling apparently just a little bit out of the picture. But the Queen's duties continued as usual. None more traditional and colourful than the state opening of Parliament, where the Queen announced the official plans for the year ahead. My government will play their full part in maintaining the North Atlantic Alliance, the friendship which links us to our great ally, the United States of America, is a powerful element in the defense of peace. Throughout the coming session, my government will go on working for the success of the Geneva Conference on the discontinuance of nuclear weapons tests, and will do their utmost to achieve comprehensive disarmament under effective international control. My lords and members of the House of Commons, I pray that the blessing of Almighty God may rest upon your councils. Across the Atlantic, America was marking the inauguration of a charismatic new leader. 43-year-old John F. Kennedy was the youngest president in the country's history. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. But it was a difficult time to take office as Cold War tensions between America and the Soviet Union were escalating. Both countries were determined to prove themselves the ultimate superpower. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. In January 1961, America successfully sent Ham the Chimp into orbit. But just three months later, Russia went one step further. Yuri Gagarin became the first man ever to be sent into space. Paraded in front of millions, he was the ultimate Soviet hero. But this battle of egos was about to get deadlier. US spy planes had discovered Soviet missile bases in Cuba, just 90 miles from America. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. America forced the USSR to the negotiating table by sending battleships to form a blockade off the coast of Cuba. For two weeks, the fear of nuclear war hit home in Britain. Finally, both sides reached a compromise, and Russian President Khrushchev agreed to withdraw its nuclear missiles. The whole country could relax once again, and thousands did as they headed to the seaside. Holiday camps were becoming increasingly popular too, with as much relaxation as the British sun would allow, with fun and games for the young and flexible, including a new classic, Twister. And the more players, the better. For the more adventurous travelers, foreign holidays were taking off. 20 years ago, it would have been a dream. Now it's become part of our way of life. In the jet age, far off lands are familiar and inviting places. Prince Philip was also flying the flag abroad and in 1962 embarked on a two-month tour of South America. This is Peru, dominated by the Incas for at least 500 years before the 16th century when they yielded to the all-conquering Spaniards. Surely of all the varied sites of Prince Philip's tour, nothing can have been more impressive than the Inca ruins. And when the Duke got into a spot of bother in Bolivia, the excited locals were on hand to help. Back in the city, it was clear that La Paz couldn't have too much of Prince Philip. In 1963, the Queen was about to be drawn into difficult political territory, a speculation world around Downing Street. After six years in office, Tory Prime Minister Harold Macmillan was seriously ill and had decided to resign. 
As he was too unwell to travel to Buckingham Palace, Her Majesty visited him in hospital. She would have the task of choosing his successor. After officials had sounded out the party, Her Majesty's final choice was 60-year-old Alec Douglas Hume. From the palace, the Queen sent for Lord Hume to invite him to form a government. He was now on his way to number 10 as Prime Minister, an office few people until recently ever thought would be his. He would be the Queen's fourth Prime Minister, inheriting a colourful Britain. Just like hemlines, living standards continued to rise. The cost of the average house was six and a half times lower than today's equivalent. Which meant you could pick up a brand new two-bedroom bungalow for just two and a half thousand pounds. Interiors were also undergoing a radical change. Time for reflection while taking it easy is the latest idea on the furniture scene. It's made from PVC and uses air for interior springing. Of course, one has to take care with pins. And while not everyone cares for the transparent look, it has its advantages. Even the most delicate female can throw it around. And household invention wasn't just limited to furniture. Now see how you'll do the ironing tomorrow. Look, no hands. Imagine it. This really is magic. In April 1962, the Duke of Edinburgh had a personal engagement to attend to. Prince Charles was off to public school. This is the really modern way to go to school, by aeroplane, piloted by father. Breaking with royal tradition by not being privately tutored, the heir to the throne would spend the next five years at Gordonston, the school which 30 years before had served his father so well. The monarch and her husband wanted their 13-year-old son to be treated like any other pupil, and there would be no royal privileges. Dougald Mackenzie, head of Windmill House, is a joiner's son, so the prince will be living in a much more democratic atmosphere than if he'd gone to Eton or Harrow. If it makes Prince Charles as good a man as his father, it will have served him and the country well. And it wasn't long before Princess Anne was also ready for boarding school. Accompanied by her mother, she was all smiles as she arrived for her first day at the all-girls school, Benenden. At Benenden, every new pupil has a girl called a mother to help her over the ordeal of the first few days. To all appearances, however, Princess Anne was not suffering from nerves. Meanwhile, tragedy was about to hit America and shock the whole world. On November the 22nd, 1963, John F. Kennedy arrived in Dallas with his beautiful wife, Jackie. Cheered on by well-wishers, the presidential motorcade set off through the city. At 12.30 p.m., in front of thousands, President Kennedy was assassinated. Everyone would remember where they were when they heard. The 35th President of the United States was buried at Arlington National Cemetery. His young son, John F. Kennedy Jr., saluted his father. All of you who have written to me know how much we all loved him and that he returned that love in full measure. It is my greatest wish that all of these letters be acknowledged. They will be, but it will take a long time to do so. But I know you will understand. May I thank you again on behalf of my children and of the President's family for the comfort that your letters have brought to us all. Thank you. Two years later, the Queen invited Jackie Kennedy and her young children to England to be part of a very special ceremony. On behalf of Great Britain, the Queen dedicated woodland and a memorial to the fallen president. Here at Runnymede, 750 years ago, Magna Carta was signed. Among our earliest statutes, it has rightly been regarded as the cornerstone of those liberties which later became enshrined in our system of democratic government under the rule of law. This is a part of the heritage which the people of the United States of America share with us. Therefore, it is altogether fitting that this should be the site of Britain's memorial to the late President John F. Kennedy. This acre of English soil is now bequeathed in perpetuity to the American people in memory of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, 
who in death my people still mourn, and whom in life they loved and admired. As the 60s went on, royal formalities and protocol began to ease off. Prince Philip led the way. At a charity lunch for his Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, he drew a healthy audience from the entertainment world. The Duke knows what to expect when he lunches with a variety club. Tony Cooper. Put his head up, huh? <laughs> Now, would you just hold the tray like that? No, I, I told you, I turn around here like that. There we go. There we go. I put it there like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. Thank you very much. Just hold it. Just, 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 just hold the tray down there. Just turn it like that. That's it. Hold it there like that. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> there In 1964, aged 37, the Queen gave birth to her fourth child, Prince Edward Anthony Richard Louis. He would soon have a playmate. Princess Margaret and her husband, now titled Lord Snowden, had already been blessed with a son, David. And just seven weeks after the Queen's happy news, they introduced their daughter to the world. The star of this royal group is two months old Lady Sarah Armstrong Jones. She was being taken to Buckingham Palace for baptism in the private chapel. The name is chosen, Sarah Frances Elizabeth. All the world is waiting for pictures of this ideal family. Later that year, after 13 years of conservative rule, the general election was heating up. Sir Alec Douglas Hume was fighting to keep the top job, but around the country, the mood was overwhelming. The public wanted change. The Conservatives have done nothing since they've been in. I really think that if the Labour do get it, it's disastrous. Disastrous. Labour leader Harold Wilson was determined to end 13 wasted years. He liked to portray himself as a man of the people, more in touch than his opponents. For James Harold Wilson, 42,200... For this smashing 19,000 majority, my very warm thanks. I will not... I will not at this time comment on the results that are coming in from other constituencies. I have heard some of them. I would describe them as moderately encouraging, and we must see how the rest of the night works out. By a narrow majority, Harold Wilson clinched victory, and his supporters celebrated into the night. But as the Queen's fifth Prime Minister was finding his feet, the world of politics, like the rest of the country, was united in sorrow. In his 90th year, Sir Winston Churchill passed away. On a cold and wet winter's day, the funeral cortege of Britain's greatest wartime leader started its journey to St Paul's Cathedral. Thousands lined the route to pay their respects to the man who led Britain to victory in World War II. The Queen and her government accorded Sir Winston the rare honour of a state funeral. Unusually, Her Majesty set protocol aside and placed Churchill's family ahead of her own. And the nation remembered the man who had called them to arms a generation before. We shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight on the landing grounds, we shall fight in the fields and in the streets, we shall fight in the hills, we shall never surrender. After the ceremony, dockside cranes bowed in salute as his flag-covered coffin travelled to his final resting place near his ancestral home, Blenheim Palace. Midway through the decade, the 60s really had started swinging. Centred around London's Carnaby Street, the fashion and cultural scene burst with multicoloured statements of youth and style. Miniskirts were all the rage, and thanks to the budding designer Mary Quant, they were one of the defining fashions of the decade. There were also extremely strict instructions for getting in and out of cars. Push your right leg in first, 
and push your knees together. And from this position, you can go as low down as an E-type or a Lotus Alarm. Push down here, tucking your seat in first. Tuck your left leg in here, and you're ready to drive off. And where better to wear your miniskirt than in the little car with the big heart, the Mini? It was fast becoming the car of choice and a British style icon. Music was hitting new heights as well. Out at sea, the UK's first pirate radio station was launched. This is Radio Caroline on 199, England's first commercial radio station. My name's Simon D. with you for the next two hours. And four boys were on the cusp of becoming the most commercially successful and critically acclaimed band in music history. It was, of course, the Beatles. Here are some of the lucky 2,500 who really are going to see the Beatles at the ABC Ardwick Manchester. After five UK number ones in 1963, Beatlemania had swept the country. But those lucky enough to be at a concert wouldn't be able to hear John, Paul, George or Ringo over the screaming. Awards and accolades soon rolled in. Some even came with the royal stamp of approval. Soon, the cheeky lads from Liverpool were international stars, topping charts and breaking hearts on both sides of the Atlantic. Did you have a chance to get away from anybody any time on the trip? Yeah, you got away from me twice. <laughs> <laughs> what, did, what did you most like about the trip, Ringo? Oh, I just loved all of it, you know, especially yeah. Miami. Yeah. The sun, you know. I didn't know what it meant until I went over there. <laughs> I, hear, I hear anyway that the four of you are going to be millionaires by the end of the year. Oh, oh yeah. that's nice. Have you, have you got time, <laughs> have you got time, to, you got time to actually spend this money? What money? Doesn't he give any to you? No, no, no. he's in that car of his. <laughs> in 1965, the Fab Four were summoned to Buckingham Palace and each invested as members of the British Empire. They were officially pop royalty. In May, the Queen and Prince Philip arrived in Germany. 20 years after the end of World War II, it was the first visit to the country by a British sovereign since 1913. The royal visit aimed to rekindle a friendship between countries previously ripped apart by war. In Berlin, the Queen inspected the British garrison before visiting the city's main Commonwealth cemetery. The royal couple paid their respects to the thousands of Allied servicemen who were laid to rest here. The majority were from the Royal Air Force, shot down over Berlin. The Queen and Prince Philip were also taken to see the Berlin Wall, the brutal fortified frontier separating communist East Germany from its democratic Western neighbour. The most dramatic minutes of the whole tour were spent in visiting the wall. That hated symbol of the division, first of Germany itself, second of almost the whole world. In John F. Kennedy Square, surrounded by thousands of well-wishers, it was just left to lend support to a country which was literally divided in two. Mr. Governing Mayor, I and my husband counted it a privilege to accept your invitation to place our names in the golden book of this famous city of Berlin. Godspeed in the great tasks which lie before you, in which you can count you can continue to count upon the full support of the British government and people. This new spirit of friendship, however, would soon be tested. And for football fans across the nation, 1966 would be an unforgettable year. England was hosting one of the biggest sporting events of the decade, the World Cup. England versus Uruguay in the opening match on July the 11th at Wembley. But the day after the coveted trophy was put on display, disaster struck. The trophy had been stolen. The international row about the theft of the World Cup is now squarely centred on the security arrangements under which display was authorised here. After a nationwide hunt, the gold trophy, clumsily wrapped in newspaper, was unearthed by Pickles. Pickles, the 14-month-old mongrel, found fame when he sniffed out the missing World Cup. With his master, David Corbett, he went along to a London hotel to receive his award. A silver medal presented by the National Canine Defence League. 
It's all a bit bewildering for Pickles, but for the suddenly world-famous Pooch, there's more glamour to follow. He's been signed up to appear in a film, the title, The Spy with a Cold Nose. On the 11th of July, 1966, the Queen welcomed the world to Wembley. I am very pleased that this country is acting as host for the final phases of the World Cup. I welcome all our visitors and feel sure that we shall be seeing some fine football. It now gives me great pleasure to declare open the eighth World Football Championships. As she greeted the England team, millions across the nation were glued to the TV, hoping for a home victory. After a nil-nil draw with Uruguay, England supporters were prepared for a bumpy ride as the tournament progressed. But they would make it through. England were in the final. Against their arch-rival, West Germany. The Queen and Prince Philip were among the 93,000 supporters who packed Wembley Stadium for this epic match. 400 million people around the world watched a game that would go down in sporting history. Germany took an early lead, but England pulled it back. It's equaliser! It's there! Peters has scored! And finally, there was hope. They were leading 2-1. Hearts across the country sank as Germany equalised. On tenterhooks, the nation watched and prayed as the match went into extra time. No one was more on the edge of their seats than England manager Alf Ramsey. They'd done it. England had won the World Cup. Just three months later, however, there was tragedy on an unimaginable scale. Disaster had struck in Aberfan, a small mining village in South Wales. An avalanche of coal slurry had buried a local school, and hundreds of children and their teachers were trapped. Everybody helped search for survivors. Then came the command, stop and listen. Someone had thought he heard the cry of a child. Through the night, the search continued, until finally there was no hope left of finding anyone alive. In total, 116 children and 28 adults perished in what remains one of Britain's worst post-war disasters. Not wishing to hinder the rescue work, the Queen waited before she visited the scene of devastation and offered what little comfort she could to the bereaved families. In 1967, after 30 years abroad, a royal couple came back into the public eye after causing the biggest crisis in the modern history of the monarchy. Into Britain this evening, the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. They've just celebrated their 30th wedding anniversary, the wedding that cost him the British throne. From among their many journeys, today's is particularly notable, for it's to attend a royal family ceremony, the first such occasion that the Duke and Duchess have attended since the abdication. As King Edward VIII, he had abandoned the throne in 1936 for the twice-divorced American Mrs. Wallace Simpson. 
En route from his Paris home, the Duke played down the significance of the Queen's invitation to the press. It's only natural that as her eldest son that we should be invited to this fairly private and family ceremony uh, in tribute to my mother. And the Duchess and I would also like to express the sincere hope that the uh, very the private nature of our visit will be respected. The occasion was the centenary of the birth of his mother, Queen Mary, who had died in 1953. The Queen Mother was also in attendance. As wife of his younger brother, George VI, her life had been turned upside down by the abdication. But it was Elizabeth II who gently welcomed the Windsors back into the family fold, three long decades after the scandal had rocked the monarchy. The differences that arose out of the events of 30 years ago melted away at this memorial to Queen Mary. There was national celebration later in the year when Francis Chichester sailed into history after completing his epic single-handed voyage around the world. 250,000 well-wishers cheered and sang to welcome home the 65-year-old adventurer who had inspired the nation. Sir Francis was knighted using the same sword with which Queen Elizabeth I had dubbed Sir Francis Drake four centuries earlier. And soon, there was another maritime landmark as the Queen launched the most famous luxury cruise liner of its time. I name this ship Queen Elizabeth II. And 1967 was officially named the Summer of Love. Inspired by the subculture thriving in San Francisco, the flower became a symbol of peace, love and brotherhood. Thousands of hippies made the pilgrimage to Woburn Abbey for the first open-air rock music event in Britain. Called the Festival of Flower Children, it was to feature a lineup of pop and psychedelic bands. chance to tune in, turn on and rock out was perhaps the biggest draw and hours passed in a haze of togetherness and sweet smelling smoke. Anything and everything was possible as long as you were adorned with multicolored flowers. But not everyone was high on love and peace. In London, 10,000 student demonstrators took to the streets on a peaceful protest against the Vietnam War. The mood at the rally was described as good-humoured, but when the protesters arrived at the US Embassy in Grosvenor Square, it was surrounded by police. Violence quickly broke out. Eighty-six people were injured, including 25 police officers. But there was one university student who wasn't protesting. In 1969, the 20-year-old heir to the British throne arrived in Aberystwyth in preparation for his investiture as the Prince of Wales. He would learn everything about Welsh history and culture. This is the language laboratory, where, under the expert tuition of Mr. Edward Millward, Prince Charles hopes to master the intricacies and pronunciations of Welsh. After a 10-week intensive course, the young royal was crowned the Prince of Wales. It was the first major royal ceremony specifically tailored for the cameras and was broadcast in colour on the new BBC Two service. The gold ring, symbol of unity, the unity in this instance being the prince's marriage to Wales. The prince pays homage to the queen by placing his hands between those of the mother. Days before, Prince Charles had spoken of the importance of the elaborate event. I know perhaps some people would think that uh, it is rather anachronistic and out of place in, uh, in this world, which is perhaps uh, somewhat cynical. But um, 
I think it, it can mean quite a lot if, if one goes about it in the right way. I think it can uh, have some form of symbolism. I, Charles, Prince of Wales, do become your liege man of life and limb and of earthly worship. And faith and truth I will bear unto thee to live and die against all manner of folks. Mayach an echiad, wed even huffoch and duis. Agachlav ach sikarhai, homod, wed i kumurid sulwi, or gabethion am luguid and in I am more than grateful to the people of this principality for making my brief stay so immensely worthwhile and for giving me such encouragement in the learning of the language. One thing I am clear about, and it is that Wales needs to look forward without forsaking the traditions and essential aspects of her past. The past can be just as much a stimulus to the future as anything else. By the affirmation of your loyalty today, for which I express my gratitude, this will not simply be a faint hope. In front of his closest family and millions of viewers around the world, this was a royal coming of age. Accompanied by the Queen, the newly crowned Prince of Wales was presented to the Welsh people. The 60s had been a decade of extraordinary change for the monarch and country alike. So it was no surprise it was going to go out on a high. In July 1969, a team of three astronauts led by American Neil Armstrong launched into space. We have commit. We have. We have to... It would take three days to reach the Earth's nearest neighbor, a journey of 240,000 miles. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Just four months later, the astronauts were guests of the Queen at Buckingham Palace. And after years of development, Great Britain and France flew into supersonic history. Concorde, the fastest ever passenger plane, took off from Bristol. Flying at a mind-boggling 1,300 miles per hour, it would be a first-class way of travelling. And on the Queen's official birthday in 1969, it was a double celebration, as tens of thousands gathered to share the moment. Everyone was bursting with pride as this miracle of modern aviation flew overhead and this colourful decade drew to a close. In the next decade, the country faces strikes and a struggling economy. There seems little doubt now that 1970 will go down as the worst year for strike since the war. But another royal wedding and a jubilee would help bring a divided nation together. Well, we missed the coronation, so we thought we'd come to the jubilee. 